Previously on Kangazang Remote Possibilities, perennial loser Jeff Spooner has accepted an offer to travel across the galaxy with his barber Ray Scump, who it turns out is an alien being, heading back to his home planet of Kangazang. After leaving the solar system in Ray's tiny spaceship, the Marshmallow Penguin, the two travellers begin to learn more about each other and how weird they are. Chapter 3 New Life, New Civilizations Jeff awoke feeling a bit strange. He'd rolled across the floor of the ship and ended up lying face down against the wall like a piece of skirting board. But that wasn't the weird bit. He'd had a particularly vivid dream involving Kylie Minogue, a rabbit, and a tin of fruit cocktail, the stuff of many a young man's desires. Well, his at any rate. As his senses flooded back to him, he could hear music. It was Kylie again, inside the ship. Well, not literally, although he wished it was. He should be so lucky. Lucky, lucky, lucky. Ray was playing his top hits of the 80s CD again, and had piped it through the sound system. He got to his feet and shook his head a few times to wake his brain up. Once it had awoken, he commanded it to take him to the cockpit to see where they had got to. Up front, Ray was bobbing up and down in his seat to the music, which was a little too loud for Jeff. "'Where are we?' called Jeff. This startled Ray, who let out a scream in alarm. He turned the music down. "'Oh, Jeff, had a good sleep? How are the teeth?' He noticed they were slightly whiter. "'Oh, good, good. Uh, we're passing through the constellation of Profania Minor, about six light years from the sun. Take a look.' Rubbing his bleary eyes, Jeff took the seat next to Ray and looked out. Spread out in front of him was a fantastic sight, a colossal smoky nebula in clouds of blue and purple. Trillions of stars were scattered among the clouds, looking like an explosion in a sequin factory. He gasped at the wonder of it all. Ray stared ahead, unimpressed. Jeff stretched his arms and yawned. How long was I sleeping? Ray looked at his watch and squinted. About two hours. I could do with a rest myself, to be honest. He unbuckled his seatbelt and stood up, arching his spine, which clicked and crunched unceremoniously. These long drives certainly take it out of you, he complained. Not far to go now, though. Another ten light years and we'll be on Kangazang in time for fruit and cocktails. Jeff suddenly remembered his dream and felt dirty. Er, uh, how long will it take us in Earth hours? he asked. Oh, let me see, pondered Ray, pacing the length of the ship. He mumbled to himself. Ten, turn right at Bellatrix, swing through the Corriton field, I'd say. About two days, depending on traffic. Jeff slumped in disappointment. He'd had nearly enough of being cooped up in this flying toupee and was getting restless. Never mind the fact that he was now the only human being ever to have travelled out of the solar system, or the only man in existence to have seen Pluto with a naked eye. Never mind the fact that his hairdresser was a real, living and breathing alien. He was hungry and grumpy. There was plenty of time to be astonished by the wonders of the universe once he'd had a decent meal, a bath, and maybe even a... Oh my God! exclaimed Jeff. Ray heard and ran quickly back to the bridge of the ship. Looking out the windscreen feverishly, he scanned the stars for danger. What? What is it, Jeff? What do you see? he asked in panic. Jeff explained the severity of the situation. No, no, it's nothing out there. I just realised something. Something really important. Ray was getting worried. He held his breath and bit his lip. What could it be? He saw Jeff's concerned expression, the wringing of his hands and the fear in his eyes, and prepared himself for the worst. "'Where am I going to get a pint?' asked Jeff in uber-seriousness. Ray exhaled loudly. Then he turned and walked away again. Jeff followed him. "'I'm serious, Ray. I don't think I could last without a couple of pints a week. I should have packed some cans, a bottle of wine, even gin at a push.' Ray looked exasperated. "'I might have guessed. What is it with you Earthmen and alcohol?' Jeff tried his best to explain. Well, you've got to have a pint now and again, haven't you? It's like, well, it's one of the reasons for going to work so you can get bladded on Friday, isn't it? Then he remembered that Ray never went to the pub. He was obviously one of those boring teetotal nerds who hated the whole booze culture that made Britain great, which, in all honesty, it didn't. You don't drink, do you? I forgot, said Jeff. I suppose it's poisoned you aliens, makes you shrivel up or something. Ray shook his head. Not at all. I can drink it. I could probably drink you under the table if I wanted to, but I never touch the stuff. Why? "'Cause it makes you act like a twat.' Jeff was a little insulted by this, but he didn't want to act upon his offended feelings, as the only person who knew how to operate this fibrous flying machine was in front of him. He tried another tack. OK, you're a control freak, I'm a free spirit, each to his own. But seriously, Ray, is there anything like beer on your planet?' Behind his back, he crossed his fingers to try and influence a positive answer. "'Course there is,' came the answer, positively. Jeff grinned. His life was complete now. Nothing else could dampen his spirits once spirits were dampening his liver.' 
Ray continued, and it was sweet, sweet music to Jeff's booze-ravaged hepatic organ. The best drinks in the universe are out here. There are lagers that drive you temporarily insane and leave without a hangover. Wines that don't make you wince with a first sip. Stout that would make a leprechaun weep. Enough! Enough! exclaimed Jeff, jumping up and down like a five-year-old. Where can we get a drink? All right, OK, said Ray, giving in. See that group of stars over there? He indicated to the right. Services. We can stop off, get some food, I can stretch my legs, and you can have your flipping drink. Ray steered the marshmallow penguin over to the left and headed towards a relatively small solar system. Well, smaller than the only one Jeff knew at any rate, and approached the greenish moon a lot smaller than the Earth. Beside it, at a distance of around a million kilometres or so, was a huge sandy beige world shrouded by clouds. Ray and Jeff buckled their seatbelts as a crackle came over the ship's sound system. Unidentified craft, you are in violation of profanian space. Identify yourself immediately, said a voice. It was crackly, but it sounded vaguely female. What was that? said Jeff. I don't know, replied Ray in confusion. The last time I was here was over twenty years ago, and it was free space then. Perhaps there was a war or something. He looked ahead and saw two larger spaceships, fish-like and agile, heading towards them. They were more like the type of spaceship that Jeff expected to see, silver and aerodynamically designed, although aerodynamics is a little pointless in space. At least they weren't hairy. They glided to within a few hundred metres of Ray's ship and held their positions. I think we should get out of here, said Ray, feverishly strapping himself in and stabbing buttons on the console. Jeff did the same. Who are they, and why do they want us? he yelled. The voice came through again. We can hear you, you know. I'll say it again. You're in violation of profanian space. Identify. Ray and Jeff looked at each other. I suppose we better add, said Ray. Pulling on the small microphone mounted above his head, he cleared his throat. Uh, profanian authorities, this is Barbara Ray Sprambladak Fastalon Scump, captain of the Marshmallow Penguin. I'm trying to make a quick stop over on your second moon to rest and get some provisions. Is that all right? Then he added, uh, over? There was a short crackle, then the voice came back. Marshmallow Penguin, we have scanned your vessel and see that you are accompanied by another person. Identify. Jeff stared at Ray, his eyes revealing terror. Ray mimed a, I don't know what to do, kind of shrug, accompanied by what he thought was a fitting facial expression. He leaned into the microphone again. Uh, my passenger is from Earth. Um, his name is Spooner. Listen, if it's all the same to you chaps, we'd be getting out of your uh, hair, so to speak. So if you just let us pass, we'll be... Desist. You are unarmed and we are quite capable of destroying you in an instant. Therefore, we will dictate in this situation. You are now prisoners of the Profanian Empire and will land on the surface. Any attempt to escape will be met with your immediate destruction. That is all. Oh, bugger, said Ray. One of the silver spaceships led the way while the second one followed after Ray's craft. They descended through the atmosphere of the beige planet and were directed to a landing platform near one of the major cities. Jeff tried to get a look at this, his first proper alien landscape, but there wasn't much to see, just a load of rocks, mountains and the odd clump of greenery. It reminded him of his trip to Tunisia back in his student days. Even the sky wasn't some exotic shade, just the standard blue with fluffy white clouds. But over to the extreme right he noticed movement. Far off in the distance he saw a multitude of bright orange dots kicking up dust as they moved along. It was a herd of exotic animals, possibly kangaroos. He watched the animals settle for a moment, then bounce along again. Once the ship had settled, Ray and Jeff looked out of the porthole and saw two armed soldiers approach their ship. They were clad in gleaming gold and silver armour with headgear that looked rather like motorcycle helmets except for plumes of yellow and white hair that flowed out of the top and went down the back of the soldier. As he looked further, Jeff saw that the soldiers had proportionately longer legs than was normal. Not freakishly long, but just longer than average, long enough to make him wonder. Then he saw the heels. Hallelujah! These soldiers were women! They wore high heels, almost too high to walk comfortably in, but they seemed to manage well enough. This must be some kind of warrior race like the Amazons, either that or a troop of cabaret dancers. Please, God, he muttered, don't let them be drag queens. Ray pushed the ship's door open and clambered out. Jeff followed, climbing down and out of the ship as calmly as he could. This was scuppered by his abruptly falling over as he took the last step down. So much for impressing the birds, then. He jumped up, brushed off the dust, and acted like nothing had happened. Ray went to his side and whispered out the corner of his mouth. Just follow my lead. Don't make any sudden moves. This impressed Jeff. What? You've got an escape plan, replied Jeff in the same edge-of-mouth whisper. No, I just don't want you to get me killed. Charming, said Jeff. The soldiers raised elegant but deadly pistols at the stunned travellers. One of the soldiers stepped up, brandishing two pairs of metallic manacles. Hands, said the soldier. 
Jeff looked up into the tinted visor, trying to get a look at the person inside, but all he saw was his own distorted reflection. Both he and Ray offered their wrists, and the manacles were quickly clamped on. Ray thought he had better open the lines of communication. He quickly thought of a few statements such as, We are a peaceful people. We come in peace. And the good old favourite, Take me to your leader. But in the end, he settled for a more fitting and important demand. Please don't kill me. Please. Please. I'm only a lowly hairdresser. I'm worthless. I'm too young to die. He dropped to his knees to look especially penitent. Jeff was visibly shaken by this pitiful act, but thought it best to follow Ray's lead as instructed. He fell to his knees beside Ray and also made a shocking display of himself. Show mercy. Please. We're unarmed. Don't hurt us. An act of defiance it wasn't. The soldier was unimpressed. Get up, she barked. Ray did as he was told, as did Jeff, who got up a little slower, so as to get a good long look at the frankly stunning legs of his captors. It was like a gold-plated lap dance. The two helpless and hungry captives were marched briskly across the dusty path until they got to a large doorway surrounded by what looked like a fortress. The soldier banged three times on the door with the handle of her pistol, and the door clanged and rumbled as it began to slide upwards. As soon as it got to about six feet, it stopped and the prisoners were shoved under it. The inside of the fortress was dark, cold, and a little smelly. Jeff whimpered in trepidation at the thought of ending up as a cliché, chained to some dungeon wall without his skin. Up ahead was a source of light which indicated that not every room was dank and dreary. There was, literally and figuratively, light at the end of the tunnel. After what seemed like an eternity of being marched through winding corridors, Jeff and Ray came to what resembled a pair of elevators. Pushed apart by the soldiers, they were directed into one each. A voice bellowed out through wall-mounted speakers. Kill the parasites! Transparent doors slid closed in front of them, and both men looked on in horror as strobe lights flashed violently at them for thirty seconds. Ray and Jeff screamed in fear, then stopped in momentary confusion. They realised that they weren't being killed, or in any pain, and they apparently weren't the parasites being referred to. Suddenly their clothes began to dissolve, broken down into their component molecules by the lights. The screaming resumed. Up above, in one of the opulent towers, was a throne room. Looking somewhat like a Roman palace, it was draped in silks and the walls were decorated with life-size statues. Large marble pillars at each corner supported the domed roof where a fantastically intricate and colourful stained-glass design let the daylight through. On a raised dais at the far end of the room was a huge throne. This was as luxuriant and ornate as any other, except it was in a delicate shade of pink. There were feather boas draped around it, and the air had a floral fragrance to it. Sitting on the throne was a beautiful woman. In fact, to say that she was beautiful was probably an insult. She was possibly the most physically perfect woman in the galaxy. It was almost impossible to determine her exact age as she looked youthful and pampered, but in actual fact her vanity, and a liberal amount of cosmetic adjustments, hid the fact that she was nearer forty than twenty. Taller than her subjects, finely upholstered in all the right places, but just enough muscle tone to give off the impression that she could kick some serious bottom, eyes that were glossy and blue enough to have been cookie-cuttered out of a summer sky. Her perfect golden skin bore little makeup except for dark, smoky eyeshadow and glistening red lipstick that looked like strawberry jam. Her face was a divine sculpture framed by a lush, silvery white mane of wavy hair, which was decorated sporadically with tiny gold beads and tubes. She was wrapped in a glittering golden toga, which showed off just enough neck, cleavage, leg and calf to drive any red-blooded man wild with desire. To complete the look, she bizarrely wore huge, chunky army-style boots with thick soles. A handmaiden entered from a side door, saluted her queen, and made her report. Your Majesty, the two trespassers have been captured. The queen spoke, her voice like sun-warmed honey. I know. Sod off. Scratch that. Sun-dried pie and mash. The handmaiden quickly retreated. The queen watched as the door opened and the two prisoners, now in strange white loincloths and nothing else, were sent in. Jeff took one look at the gorgeous vision in front of him and instantly forgot Kylie. He moved his manacle hands down to cover his shame. Ray was one step ahead of him, already embarrassed to be wearing a nappy. The Queen stood up. Although she was on a dais, she would have towered over both men easily. She smiled with an air of superiority briefly before addressing them. What you think you're playing at, eh? A thick cockney brogue spewed out of her mouth, totally contradicting her elegance and grace. This is our bleeding patch, you're right. No place for you bleeding men. Don't you know who I am? Jeff didn't mind the accent. He, like many thirty-somethings from Earth, used to carry a torch for Lorraine Chase, the actress who shot to fame in the late seventies for her stunning good looks and working-class twang. In fact, if he had a couple of Campari sodas right then, he'd definitely give her one. Ray decided to keep it simple. Uh, hello. Good start. 
He accompanied his greeting with a weak grin as if she were a next-door neighbour. I don't believe we've met. I'm Ray Scump and this is Jeff. Jeff found his tongue at last. Spooner. Jeff Spooner. How's it going, babe? Connery would have been proud. The Queen stepped down from the dais, still towering over them by a foot. She walked up to Jeff, whose face was exactly the same height as her chest. It was close enough to sniff. So he did. The Queen slapped Jeff across his cheek. Hard. He spun and hit the deck. Dirty git, she exclaimed. Then she turned to Ray, who whimpered and cowered, covering his face with the manacles. She leaned close to his scrunched-up face. Scamp, you got a bloody cheek showing your airy mug round here. Ray was dumbstruck, although not as dumbstruck as Jeff, who was literally dumb and struck. He needed answers. Uh, I've never been here before, your worship tattooed. I think you must be mistaken me for... Ah, how do you know me? The Queen returned to her throne. She eyed Jeff, who was still on the floor, and decided whether to get up or not. On your feet, you bloody wimp, she bawled. Jeff got up quickly, rubbing his red cheek. I know you, mate, because of what your old man did, she began, pointing an immaculately manicured finger at Ray. I don't know who that muppet is, the finger went to Jeff. But your daddy declared war on all of us here. Ray was totally confused. I don't understand your highnessness. My father was a humble hairdresser, just like me. I'm sure he never declared anything on anyone. The Queen glared at both of the nappy-clad men. Does the name Baker Lou mean anything to you? She asked. Ray shook his head dumbly. So did Jeff. Michelle Baker Lou? She demanded. Ray's face visibly changed from confusion to surprise in an instant. Michelle Baker Lou? Shelley Baker Lou? I have heard of her, actually. She used to go out with my dad just after my parents divorced. He smiled. Finally, they were getting somewhere. Did you know her, then? He asked in a pleasantly social manner. The Queen glared once again, but kept her temper. You could say that. What do you know about her? Ray relaxed a bit. He began to pace around as he talked, which frightened Jeff a bit. Shelley Baker Lou. My dad met her when he was hairdressing for a living. She was a bit younger than him, but they got together and went out for a while. Gorgeous-looking woman, by all accounts. Pretty as a picture, but really vain. Hard work with Shelley. Then it went a bit pear-shaped. She was trying to make it as a model, and went to him for a top-notch hairdo. Unfortunately, he got nervous and overdid the peroxide. All her hair fell out, and it never grew back. Well, suffice to say, he dumped her. She freaked out and went off across the galaxy. Nobody ever saw her again. Dad couldn't handle being with a baldy, I suppose. He chuckled for a second. At this point, the Queen strode right up to Ray and grabbed him by his goatee. Ray squealed in pain as she pulled him close to her face. Got it in one, mate. Who'd want to be seen with a bird who looked like that? A bird who looked like this. She ripped off her silvery locks and threw them to one side. Her hairless scalp shone in the sunlight. Jeff gasped in amazement. Ray! I think she's Shelley Bakerloo, he whispered. The Queen raised an eyebrow. Quick, innie, she said dryly. Queen Shelley, ruler of the slags of Profania to you, mate, she roared, still in Ray's face. And you're going to pay dearly for what your daddy did to me. I could tell you that for nothing. Jeff looked over at Ray. Nice one, mate, he muttered. It'll be fun, you said. Beaches and cocktails, he huffed in disappointment. The still bald and frankly still beautiful monarch released Ray's beard and walked over to Jeff, who began to flinch and twitch uncontrollably as he was expecting another slap or possibly much worse. Shelley snapped her fingers and another handmaiden hurried to her side carrying a golden tray on which rested another wig, this one straight and black like Cleopatra. The handmaiden helped her place it back on a ruler's head and hurried away, scooping up the discarded blonde one as she went. OK, babe, she said with lashings of sarcasm. You're a big strong man, I'm going to make you a deal. Jeff swallowed and croaked out a reply. Er, uh, OK. What kind of deal? He said cautiously. Glad you asked, said the Queen, as she strode around the terrified travellers. I could, should, and would have the both of you executed immediately, but I think I can make some use of you. How fit are you, little man? Jeff decided not to try either charm or wit again, so he answered simply. Er, uh, pretty fit, I'd say. Why? Queen Shelley stopped pacing when she got to Jeff again. Once again he flinched, which made her smile. Well, I could do with some entertainment round here, so here's the deal. You take the trials. If you succeed, you spend the rest of your useless lives as eunuchs serving me around here, or you can refuse to take them and end up as heads on sticks outside the palace. Your choice. Admittedly, it wasn't much of a choice. Either way, they were destined to lose their lives. Jeff put his hand up. Uh, excuse me, your majestic tasticness. What if I take these trials and fail? This made the Queen laugh. Oh, you know if you fail, because you'll be dead anyway, and Scamp here will face death by humiliation. Ray flinched this time and frowned in despair. 
Jeff looked at him quizzically, and Ray just replied to the look with a simple, You don't want to know. He didn't. Ray stepped forward, gathering all the courage he had, which wasn't much. Take me, your wondrousness. Not Jeff. He's an innocent in all this. Let me do the trials. Shelley considered Ray's sickening plea and shook her head. Nah, you wouldn't last a minute, scum. Anyway, I want you where I can see ya. She clapped twice to summon her guards. Take Airy over here to the dungeons, and take this one out to prepare for the trials. Ray was manhandled out of the throne room, protesting feebly, while Jeff was pushed and shoved in the opposite direction through a side door and into what looked like some kind of armory. The queen sat back on her throne. She picked up a small pink hand mirror and ran a finger through her fringe. Ah, revenge your power, she sighed. I just can't lose. End of chapter 3